1968, it was kind of difficult for women to play. Nobody wanted to play with women. Everybody thought women shouldn't play. And this has persisted up until, I would say, into the late 80s, 90s. Well, it's been kind of a hard, long road with that. It's a lot better now. But when I got back, I got all kinds of people calling me and asking me, what do you think you're doing? How dare you? I got a death threat. I'm a, I was going to be murdered if I ever taught any other women to play, et cetera, et cetera. But I persisted. I was one of the first women in the United States to play this drum. Even when one can think that being a university professor is a situation of great privilege, and it is, unquestionably it is, even in those arenas, minorities and women might be subjected to discrimination and to a very different treatment. Um, I experienced at the University of San Francisco having to grieve for seven years uh, against the university who had hired me on a term appointment that would not give me any possibility of tenure, any possibility of permanence or uh, progress at the university while using my name, my curriculum, my experience to uh, get from Washington funding for a bilingual program. When I first got into media, which was accidental, it was a lot of pressure uh, to try and make me not do what I do. I came in uh, Rasa Media, uh, and it was an old uh, Latin show. I'm from New York, and, uh, and, and so I wanted to get the jazz in there and the calypso and all the rest of the stuff that I love, and I started slipping in there piece to piece, and everybody said, oh, you can't do that, you can't do that. And I had a lot of negative pressure and, and sexist, racist kind of stuff that was going on. But my program is probably the only one that has been on, and we've been on for, I've been doing it for 40 some odd years. And so obviously it uh, didn't work. The things that I had to kind of aguantar at that point, questions, daily questions of what I was in the city of Philadelphia where it's very black and white. Um, you know, assumptions and racist things that professors would say to me. Um, I once was asked if I was from El Salvador, Ca. Uh, as in El Salvador CA. That was actually a serious question. Um, you know, I was asked if, what did I study in Chicano literature? Did I study newspaper articles about gangs? Um, so the higher you get, the actually more fierce and difficult it gets to maneuver people's racism, people's uh, assumptions about you as a woman and a woman of color. It was the very first page that he read, and then he said, um, uh, I, it looks like I'm going to have to apologize. At that point, um, I actually cried because I knew that um, I had been justified to stand my ground and that I, I knew I was deserving of an A. But I also knew that what had happened to me was just so completely wrong. And what was sad was that he made it worse by telling me that um, his apology was, you have to understand that um, in this school, we don't expect that kind of writing from immigrants. For me, it's a trickle effect. It's all the things combined. It's walking down the street and, and somebody looking at you because you're different. It's going to, going to school and being looked at as, uh, as somebody different. Uh, your accent is different. The way you walk, you're different. What are you? You know, who are you? But I think a lot of it is, what are you? You know, what is your identity? As though I don't have one, you know. Experiencing sexual abuse until the age of six uh, by a family member. When I went to therapy myself, it was very eye-opening, very empowering. I felt that it was the first time in my life that I was allowed to speak out about the abuse. Um, because as a child, I felt very silent a moment in my life when I was 13 years old that I was going through a lot of uh, deep emotion, a lot of things happening in my surroundings where I got to the point that I felt that there was no other way um, out but to try and take my own life. Oh, I come from a family of uh, migrant farm workers. Uh, as a child I worked in the fields. The last time I went to work in the fields, I was 17 years old, very young, a teenager. But I was out there with my parents and my brothers and sisters picking plums, um, strawberries, oranges. Writing 
became a way for me to overcome all of the um, the stuck emotions that I felt. I felt um, after my mother died, I was I was paralyzed and pretty much confined to my bed, very depressed for several years. And it was writing that pulled me out of that deep depression. Uh, during that time, I visited the financial aid officer and went over my financial aid award and discovered that I did not have enough money to actually attend Davis. Uh, and there was no way that my mother could help me to make it. The counselor suggested that I consider coming back at a later time in my life or that I go the community college route and work and save up money and maybe I can transfer in. I left our office devastated. Que esta nueva generación en el siglo XXI de latinos primero entienda de dónde viene, que viene de una cultura milenaria llena de poder, llena de entusiasmo y de enorme conocimiento y que con eso como la fundación de su vida, como el principio y el primer pie puedan subir y llevarnos al siglo XXI. Bueno, some of the obstacles that I have to overcome just like millions and millions of people uh, that have migrated to this country is that, you know, the issue of being an immigrant and how your self-esteem gets affected by, by the system. I had a very sharp sense of um, injustice and sex sexism. Um, my own family, I'm, you know, six out of, uh, you know, the six youngest girl out of a siblings of seven with one boy and uh, we were always told that we didn't have to go to college because we get married and it would be a wasted investment. Misdiagnosed her countless times. They, um, they got her doing all kinds of treatment and, and all kinds of things because we, we had the insurance um, for her to undergo that treatment and yet even with the insurance um, the simple fact that she wasn't a citizen of this country played a major role in the way they treated her. Unfortunately, I didn't have the encouragement of my parents because they were so busy working. So, you know, we, my sister, my brother, and I had to make decisions for ourselves, and um, I decided that I wanted to go to college. Tuve, tuve que pasar cosas difíciles. Uh, tuve que estar viviendo en casas de amigas. Uh, estuve hasta durmiendo en, en un cuarto de, de, de lavadora en unos cartones sobre el piso con mi hija y para mí fue como darle un ejemplo a ella de que aunque uno pase cosas difíciles es mejor a estar soportando el maltrato. Guillermo went through a lot. There was not integration of children with special needs. They were segregated. I really believed in mainstream. I wanted him to be around other children. He needed to hear the language and the songs and their laughter and their thinking for him to be able to be develop into a productive citizen. And through a lot of work, a lot of tears, a lot of sacrifice, Guillermo was able to do that. I was thrown in without knowing a single word. What they would do during the day is they would take us aside and put, put us in what they called the trailer. And it was really an ESL trailer where they taught us English. Pasar seis meses, un poco más de tiempo, ¿verdad? Tratando de reconstruir, salvar lo que pudimos, um, lo que entre todo, ¿verdad? Hay cosas materiales, las cosas materiales van y vienen. Pero las cosas personales, el trabajo de, de nosotros se perdió. El trabajo como profesores, mi biblioteca estaba destruida, tuve que volver a construir. But I think that healing is a process. And if you're in the midst of healing, you need to be patient with yourself. Be patient with yourself. Love yourself. Let love and support come in. You don't have to do it all by yourself. I think that's the key. There's so many loving women that can support you on your path.